There's no other vehicle in the world that allows us to put our money into it, have guaranteed tax-free compounding growth while simultaneously being able to take that money out to use it for other things. So you're telling me the banks tell us to put our money in their bank, but they're taking their money and putting it in the policy. There's a lot of different ways to use this process. Whether you're buying a car, whether you're paying for your kid's college education, whatever it might be, all of the dollars that we put into this are continually to compound for the rest of this person's insured life. That's really what's going on is compounding while we're using it. Welcome to Wealth Webinar Wednesday. I'm Stephen Nagy. I'll be hosting the show today on behalf of Chris Noggle, who is traveling the world like he seems to do all the time these days. He's out in New Zealand with uh, some of our other team with Brent Kessler and Hannah. Uh, Jason Sipple's out there. Craig Hurling. I know Joan, I believe. Jason Sipple um, and a few others uh, that you guys have seen on some of our shows. So out there, they're out there exploring the uh, outback, the wild territory of New Zealand. Hopefully they all survive because I know there's a lot of crazy bugs and animals and reptiles and snakes and things like that in New Zealand. Is that true? I don't know. I might've made that up. That might be Florida where I live, but nonetheless, hopefully they're having a great time out there. They're about 15 hours ahead. So honestly, uh, I think it's like 6 a.m. out there, but hopefully they're having a great time. So with that said, today we're going to get into a little bit about being your own bank, what that means, what we're talking about with bankers only. Uh, we have a couple guests with us today. We have Craig Yenny, who is our uh, specialist when it comes to implementing infinite banking, creating tools and strategies to basically solve your money problem or help you achieve your goals, depending on which side of that fence that you're on. And we'll talk about that today. Where are you starting now? Where are you looking at going to? And how are we going to get there in the best possible way? Because at the end of the day, everything in life, in my opinion, there's a good, there's a better, and there's a best. And we're going to talk about that today, how we can do things like we're not going to work any harder. We're not going to work any longer. We're not going to take on any more risk but we're gonna be able to change one thing in our lives. And that is where our money goes first. So by changing that one thing where our money goes first, it's gonna allow us to compound and allow us to achieve our, our goals that much faster. And where Craig comes in is, I'm very good at talking about this stuff and visualizing it and explaining it in that manner. Craig is very good at proving all the crap that I say. Fair enough. And then, of course, we have Shauna Decker here, who is uh, the brains behind this entire operation and always has some great insight into all of this because Shauna comes from, and hopefully it's okay for me to say this, Shauna, but mm -hmm. Shauna does not come from a financial background. She was never an advisor like Chris and I, um, brand new to investing and money and just happened to start working with Chris. And as a lot of you know that have been around our campfire, if you surround yourself with the right people, you start being around people like Chris, Craig, myself, our team, just from osmosis, it feels like magic, maybe it'll change your whole life. A lot of that has to do with mindset. So we do want to get into some mindset and what that looks like. Um, so that's going to be the fun of it today. So it'll be very interactive. So please comment in the chat box. If you're watching the recordings, Put your uh, the recording of this, put your comments in the YouTube section. We'll reply on there in the comments and uh, get a call schedule and chat with you that way. But if you're on live with us right now, let's have some fun here. So put your questions in the Q&A as we go. Uh, anything that's been on your mind, put it in the chat box and we'll definitely hit that for everybody today. So with that said, I'm going to kind of roll through some of this stuff real quick. So let's talk a little bit about what's going on right now. All right. So when it comes to being your own bank. What does that really mean? And at the end of the day, it really means control, controlling our money and controlling our future. Is that important this day and age, I guess is the question. Like, is it okay to kind of right now just follow along with what your financial advisor is telling you to do? Is it okay just to continue to put money into your retirement accounts, your 401k, the markets, and just let it ride? Is it okay to have that traditional mindset of how money works? And 
in my opinion, and in Chris's opinion, and, and our team's thoughts are right now is probably the worst time to just follow along with what's always been done. And let me explain that for just a second. So if you follow the stock market or not, the stock market, for example, has been at all time highs. Um, we've been bouncing off of all time highs. We've been breaking records. Uh, this has been going on now for the past, I don't know, year or so. You know, we we had a big boom and then we had a little pullback last year in 2023. And ever since it's just been booming again. Um, and as they say, all things that go up must come down. That's what a market is. A market is ups and downs, ups and downs, a roller coaster. Now that can be okay if you're in it for the long haul, but if you need that right now, it might not be the best. I mean, does anybody out here, just as an example, remember back to 2008, for example, does anybody know somebody that was approaching retirement or had a financial plan? And then all of a sudden, 2008, the real estate collapse and the market pullback and all the layoffs and everything that happened in this country. I mean, how many of you either personally or know somebody that went through that? that had to push back retirement, that had to completely change their entire financial future, that had to change things for their families. Anybody on here know that? I mean, I know personally, I experienced it in my own life as well as almost everybody around me. And so if we look at history and we're not gonna get into it right now, Chris puts out unbelievably um, well put together videos on the YouTube channel at the Chris Noggle about these topics to so go check those out. But we'll show you proving with history, with statistics and data, why right now we're at a precipice in this country. We're at a point in history that's probably going to be like no other point in history in our lifetimes. Meaning this market we're in, whether we're talking the stock market, whether we're talking real estate markets, no matter what, whatever market we're talking about, it seems like we're in a huge bubble right now. We're at all time highs. We're ready to pull back. We're ready to have a correction. We're ready to let air out of that bubble. And so right now is all about being prepared for that. So to be prepared for what's going on in the markets, we need to understand where our money is and how this opportunity is going to present itself. And the reason I call this pullback, crash, collapse, recession, depression, whatever is coming, something's coming, whatever it is, I look at it as an opportunity. And that's what we want everybody to start thinking about is how to become the 5%. Now, why do we talk about the 5%? Because the 5% at the end of the day, bottom line, cold hard, they think differently than other people. So how many of you on here right now, just as an example, if you heard, if, if if you had a crystal ball and you knew that disaster, financial disaster was coming, the economy is going to crash, we're going to get into a depression, the stock market's going to fall by 20, 30, 40, maybe 50%, the real estate market is going to pull back. You know, you're going to, there's going to be a bunch of layoffs, the, the, you know, everything's going to go wrong. If you knew that was going to happen, how many of you would just be scared to death? You'd be nervous. You wouldn't know what to do. Um, you know, you'd be scared for your family. You'd be scared for the people you love, for yourself, your retirement, whatever the case is. Would anybody be scared if they knew that was coming? Okay. Now on the flip side of that, Let's just take people like Warren Buffett, Ray Dahlia, like some of these um, Warren Buffett, some of these very well-known investors that are out there. Okay, what are they saying right now? Robert Kiyosaki, you know, people like this. Well, the ones that I follow, the ones that I study, and what my mindset is, is this is an opportunity. And so when I say, let's talk about money and opportunity, how can, if the large majority of the country is scared and doesn't know what to do, how many people, why would I then say, no, 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 this is an opportunity. I'm excited for what's coming. Why would we think differently like that? It's because we understand what's going to happen. We understand what our money is doing, and we're going to understand how we can take advantage of that situation. Now, let me just clarify something real fast, because when we start take, talking about money, there's a lot of negative uh, mindset around money sometimes. Like, you know, People get scared to talk about money. Like it, it's kind of one of those nuances. Like you don't ask somebody how much money they make. You don't ask people what they're investing in and what their net worth is and all this stuff. You know, we just, you just don't talk about it uh, typically in this country. And so, you know, why is that, you know, and, and why do so many people just follow along with what's always been done, even though it's been proven that it doesn't work for 95% of the people in this country? Like, why do they still do it? And, and a lot of that is just, Fear. 
It, it's not understanding that there's something better out there. It's having false beliefs. Um, you know, a lot of people that come to us, Craig, you can vouch for this on the phone. You know, they're, they're like, hey, you know, this all what you guys teach all sounds really cool, but I'm not rich. Like, I don't, I'm not wealthy. Like, I can't do what you guys do because, you know, it, it's just not my life. And, and that's one of the largest misconceptions that we see because what we'll show you here today right now is it doesn't matter what your starting point is today. These strategies that we teach can work for everybody. Now, if you have money, can you accelerate that even quicker? Absolutely. But if you don't have money, if you're not in a position to accelerate that, then I want you to think about, okay, if you don't do this, then what's the alternative? And unfortunately, unfortunately that alternative in most cases does not work out well for over 95% of people. So how can we start changing that? And so fear starts to, 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 to get into our mindset. We start thinking to ourselves, well, I can't do this, you know, for whatever the excuse is, for whatever the reason is. And, and fear is one of those things that's just a, it's a natural human emotion or, or, or energy or mindset or whatever you want to call it. And most people are scared of something for the simple reason they don't understand it. And because we don't talk about money, because in traditional education, high school, college, unless you specialize in finance, and even that, I would argue, traditional finance is, is not even what we're talking about here. So even with a traditional finance background, uh, most people still have fear around money. And what do I mean by money? I'm talking about good, better, best. Where can we put our money? What are some of these alternative investments? What are some of these alternative strategies that the wealthy use every single day? And why don't everyday people use those same strategies? So that fear, just not understanding, a fear of the unknown, a fear of not understanding, it's natural, it's normal. So I want everybody on here right now to think, to, to just know, like it's common, everybody feels this way. I mean, if I ask Shauna, like, when you started learning and following Chris just in the background, you know, Shauna would work in the office and she would just listen to Chris in the background. She probably thought he was crazy. Like, what's this guy talking about? Right. And I mean, you know, even Craig, like, I know you've been doing this for a long time now, but if you think back to like, when you started and you were in the corporate America world, like if you heard somebody talk about this, you probably said, Oh, I, I could never do that. That's not for me. You know, that's, or that's crazy talk or whatever the case is. Right. And, and well, so, Hey, Stephen, absolutely. I mean, I, I think one of the highlights here that I, I was going to add in is people start a job and they get comfortable with contributing to the company 401k plan and just live life and not really think about it. Like that'll be used some sometime down the road. But that question you asked, did you know anybody in 2007, 2008 that was retiring with you crashes and I'll tell you, that's the point where it was a turning point for me. I saw my parents go through this, caused a lot of grief with my my dad and you know, my mom. And and it's one of those things where I'm like, this 401k thing, and I know everyone's got a different perspective. I'm just going to rip the Band-Aid off. I don't like 401ks, and I haven't put a penny into them for over 15 plus years. But that's what I started doing is putting my money somewhere where I had more control of it. I didn't know exactly what was going to unfold, but I knew that was the first step. And and here's here's how how somebody explained the 401k to me at one point. They said, hey, Stephen, if you and I were going to go down to the bank and open an account together, I'm going to own it. You're going to fund it. I get to make all the rules. Would you go to the bank with me and create that account? Would you be willing to do that with me? Yeah. And of course, most people are like, no way. I'm not going to do that. What do you mean? I put the money in it. You control it. And, but, but isn't that a 401k? So when we start talking about control, to me, that was one of my big turning points is why am I putting money into the system? I can't use the money until I'm retired. I don't really have a lot of say in it as far as where it gets invested. So for me, that's where I backed out of it and got into doing something different. Now I'll tell you, I, I used to read, you know, some of the first books I was reading is Robert Kiyosaki, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. I loved what he's talking about. I have no idea how to implement it. And I, I would imagine there's a lot of people in our community that hear us read these things like, but I don't know how to do this. And that's where staying in this community and, and listening to these things and plugging into things like the private money club and all that we have to offer. I mean, my gosh, this is an accelerator. If I would have known about this 15 years ago, 
I mean, I was struggling around with how do I implement this implement or this infinite banking thing? I've got it started now. How do I use it? So anyway, that's just kind of some of the thoughts I had as you were kind of going through this opportunity and control discussion. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, the 401k is a great example of that. Like you said, you're giving up control. Um, you know, somebody else is making those, you know, decisions ultimately. I mean, 401ks typically give you options, but they limit you to like, you know, short term, long term or low risk, high risk, or, you know, maybe you can put it into like bonds or stocks, but you're not picking individuals. You're not able to invest in things like real estate or precious metals or private lending businesses, things of this nature. So you're very, very limited. And like you said, if you touch the money early, but with, with that said, you know, I also don't want to completely shut down 401ks because they do have some advantages. So if we're looking at good, better and best. If we just completely did not use a 401k at all, we might actually be giving up some benefits that would help us financially. So for one thing that I like about 401ks, just as an example, is a lot of companies offer a match. So if I you know, put in 6% of my paycheck, they'll match up to 6% of that, right? So that's basically them giving you a bonus, um, which in that case, yes, you're giving up control, but at the same time, I mean, that's a hundred percent return. So can that make sense? Sure. I'm okay with that. But anything higher than that amount, you know, then that's what we might want to look at. Okay. Where can we redirect that money? So, so, you know, investing in mutual funds without a 401k can be good. Investing within a 401k and a mutual funds can be better, but do maxing out the 401k in the right way only to your limits and then being very smart with the rest of that money can be best. And, and a lot of the 401k discussion also needs to be had depending on what else you're doing in your financial life, especially when it comes to taxes, because money that goes into 401k is pre-tax dollars. So it does lower your, ta your annual taxable income which depending on your situation, that can help reduce your overall tax basis. So you have to work with a CPA on that, obviously your accountant to see if that makes sense. But that is something that could be beneficial for you. Now, every single situation is different and that's something, but that's what we do. Like uh, one of the things for everybody on this call is if this stuff makes sense to you, we're gonna invite you to hop on the phone with one of our money mentors. And our money mentors are trained to have these discussions with you. You know, hey, what are you doing now? What are those goals? Is there anything we can tweak to make this a little bit better and make it the best for you? And so, you know, I would invite everybody to do that. But yeah, Craig, to your point, I mean, 401ks are, are an absolutely great example of that. I mean, so many people, you know, we're right out of college. We're excited to get our first job. We go into the, the office the first money after getting the first morning after getting hired. You know, they're like, hey, come on to HR. We're going to do all this paper work? You know, do you want insurance? Do you want this? Do you want that? You know, do you want this 401k? You're like, well, what's a 401k? They're like, well, everybody gets one. You know, it's part of the, you know, it's it's a benefit you get is, is having this job, right? So it's just one of those things we've always done, but nobody ever really steps back to think about it for a minute. And what is the best way to do that, right? Yeah. Um, and, and Carlin asked a question in the q and I guess we can just answer that. So the question is, if we're currently participating in a 401k, can we stop and close the account? Um, if you're typically, if you're actively employed with that, that company, you can stop your contributions, but you know, you wouldn't close it necessarily. And, and, you know, closing it would be something you would want to talk to your CPA about to say, what are the fees and how that impacts your, your total taxable picture. And, and since we're having this discussion, Stephen, I don't know if you have the slide that kind of talks about the disclaimer, but you know, we're not invest, investment advisors, we're not CPAs, tax specialists. So we talk a lot about this stuff, but that's not our wheelhouse. We just talk about our personal experiences and you know what we've done, what Sean has done, what Stephen's done, what I've done, and not advice, but this is just the way we do it. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the cool things is if you do have a 401k, let's say it's an old 401k, you've left the job. Now you do have the ability to take control of that 401k. Now, if it's an active job, like Craig said, you probably aren't going to have that option. Um, you can ask your HR department. It's called a, a non-hardship transfer. 
But typically with an active job, you cannot. But if it's an old job, you already left. Or once you do leave that job, then you'll have the ability to then take control of that 401k and roll it over to a direct transfer to something like a self-directed custodian. And this is where we talk a lot about self-directed investing. And this was somebody like Horizon Trust, for example, mm -hmm. who's a self-directed custodian that now you know, there's no taxes, there's no fees um, as far as penalties or anything like that. It's just moving the money from one retirement account to another retirement account. So you have no no worries there. But now that you have control of that money in a self-directed retirement account, now you can invest. It opens up the world to investments for you into businesses, precious metals, cryptos, private lending, real estate, business IP, it really opens up the world for you. And so, you know, back to that 401k, you know, maybe that's good. Once you leave now, the best thing you could do would be to move that to self-direct. And now you have all these options. It opens up, but more importantly, you have control. Remember, we, op we opened up this entire talk about having control of our money. That's the ultimate goal is to control our money, control our wealth. Once we have control, it opens up our options. Options are everything. Like the more options we have, the better off typically we're going to be in all situations. So we're going to keep bringing it back to that as we go today, the control aspect of all of this. Fair enough? Um, so, so when we start talking about, you know, the 5% controlling our wealth, you know, one thing I want to hit on real fast before we get into how we're going to do this, make that one change that changes everything. I just want to make sure we kind of understand a little bit more about what we're looking at here. So, you know, over my years, you know, I started out as a financial advisor with Ameriprise Financial out of college. Um, I learned about entrepreneurship and real estate investing um, from Robert Kiyosaki, as well as a couple of other mentors that I had in the past. And I started implementing what I was learning. I started taking action. And over the course of about a year and a half to two years, I slowly transitioned away from um, my job at Ameriprise Financial as an advisor into owning my own businesses and doing my own investments and really more than anything, changing my mindset, a complete 180 in my mindset from the traditional way of looking at money to the investor entrepreneur way of looking at money. And so over those years, uh, you know, ever since then, you know, I had the opportunity to go out and train and teach and consult and speak on stages, surround myself with much more successful people than myself, multi multi-millionaires, and spend a lot of time with them and, and really dig into that mindset aspect. And what I've been able to do is I kind of put together in my eyes why traditional investing doesn't work for the 95% and what the 5% do that's different than everybody else. And I boil it down really to these six things. And you guys can tell me what you think about these. But to me, when it comes to why more people aren't successful, it's these three wealth killers right here. It's pretty straightforward. So we're talking about taxes. We've already been hitting on taxes. Taxes will kill your financial life. I mean, if you run calculations, which Craig probably has a spreadsheet for this, but if you run calculations and you look at the difference, if you make, I don't know, let's say $100,000 a year and you pay 35% in taxes versus 20% in taxes versus 10% in taxes and on down, over the course of 10 years, the amount of money you have at the end of that time is unbelievable. It, like it, it's wild the differences. So step one, where can we start putting our money to take advantage of things like tax-free growth? Okay. So we'll talk a little bit about that today. One of those examples that we just hit on was what if you had an old 401k and you converted that to a self-directed IRA and in the process of converting that, you converted it into a Roth self-directed IRA. And we can do this. We do it for people every single day. And with a Roth IRA, the money in there, let's say you have $100,000 in a Roth IRA, you make some smart investments, you grow that $100,000 to a million dollars. Well, that $900,000 in growth within the Roth IRA, you pay zero taxes on that growth ever. So that $900,000 in gains, you'll never pay a dime in taxes on that. If you compare that $100,000 uh, $100, in growth over 10 years to becoming a million dollars outside of a Roth IRA, you're going to end up with a lot less than $900,000 in growth. So that's just a simple example. Number two, one of the other things I learned um, very quickly was when you own a business and when you have a, something like an LLC 
and you work with somebody intelligent, like a good accountant or CPA, somebody like, I'm just looking at the chat box, somebody like James Davidson, uh, like Jimmy on here. Um, you know, he's an incredible CPA. Somebody like Zach on our team, um, who's our fractional CFO. Um, you know, these different accounts that are out there, you know, I do a lot with corporate capital and Brent Carlson, but what they're able to do is they're able to take the tax code book and position your financial life in a way, if you have businesses, if you have investments, things like that, which everybody, in my opinion, should and can, but if you do this the right way, it's amazing all the av tax advantages that you have now that you can reduce your overall tax burden, allowing you to keep more of your hard-earned money. So you could take that money now, be smarter with that money to grow your wealth and accelerate your wealth that much quicker. Or if you're like me, maybe you like to donate money. So now you have more money and instead of donating it to the government, where in my opinion, they there's a lot of waste. Um, instead of giving it to them, now you have that money, you can donate it to causes that truly do make an impact on preferably your, your local communities. Um, so things like that. So again, it's not about greed necessarily. It's just about being smart with our money. But when you run these calculations, it is wild to see the differences. Um, and yeah, Greg, waste is an understatement. I was trying to be nice there. All right. So number two, inflation. And inflation is one of those things we can't control it. Maybe through who we vote for can help some, but not necessarily. At the end of the day, the Federal Reserve is going to control inflation. The Federal Reserve's target inflation rate is 2% annually. Over the last two and a half years or so, we're probably at cumulative like 19, 22% inflation. And that's being a very conservative number. It's probably much higher than that. Inflation is what you fill at the grocery store. Inflation is what you feel when you go out and you go shopping. And when you spend money, that's inflation. And inflation will erode the dollar. Inflation will erode your wealth. The best way to combat inflation, however, is to understand money, ironically, because when you understand money, like we've been talking about, now you're going to put your money in vehicles that inherently, by the way they're designed and built, combat inflation automatically for you. So we'll show you in a second here using the infinite banking concept, how by changing the one thing where our money goes first now our money is going into a vehicle that's growing and compounding uninterrupted at all times. So if we know inflation is always going to increase, let's hope we never get into deflationary times. That gets very bad on economies. But let's just assume that inflation is always going to occur for the rest of our lives. Well, would it not then make sense to also have our dollars and our money in a place that is also growing and combating inflation at all times for the rest of our lives. And it's literally that simple. So we'll show you that here in just a second, you know, as opposed to just putting your money in a bank account where it's not doing anything to combat inflation. All right. And then we look at volatility and that's what I opened up a little bit about, you know, thinking back to 2008, thinking back to what if the stock market right now pulls back 10, 20, 30, 40, 50%. Can you afford to wait? five, six, eight, 10 plus years for that to come back? I don't know. You got to ask yourselves these questions, but that's volatility. Um, you know, if all of your investments lose a lot of value, are you okay with that? Or are there things that we could be doing right now to eliminate that volatility? You know, I know one thing that all three of us are doing, uh, uh, Sean and Craig and myself at least, and a lot of people listening, is we've taken back control of our money. We've gotten, for the most part, out of the stock market, for example, that, that I believe is one of the most volatile things coming. And we're in short-term stuff. We're in, we're, in, um, we're in investments that, even if the economy crashes, we'll still do well. Uh, we have control of our money and we've educated ourselves to the point where, you know, if a crash occurs, not only are we gonna be okay, but like I opened up with, we're going to see the opportunity to step in and make a bunch of money. And again, that that opportunity, that taking advantage of, we're not taking advantage of people. And I say this all the time. Everything we do, and one of the reasons I love Chris Noggle is he has the same exact mindset when it comes to business. Everything we do, and when we have meetings with Sean and our team, we build this stuff around win-win situations. And if you guys know us, you know that our saying is the more we give, 
the more we get. We give all of our best stuff away for free. The reason we do that is because it creates win-win situations. It creates win situation for you listening because you're better educated. You're able to take advantage of things. And it's a win for us because ultimately it grows our network. It grows our campfire and it grows our businesses. Um, same thing in real estate. In 2009, uh, 2000, really 2010 is when we started buying more again. 2010, 11, 12, we were doing things like short sales, foreclosures. We were working with banks on some of these REOs and things of that nature. And what we were doing is we were doing a lot of cash for keys. We were going in and we were working with people to get them out of horrible situations, but putting them in a better situation moving forward. You know, when it comes to foreclosure, that's a tough one. If you've ever had a family member go through foreclosure before, it, it's sad. Like it, it's bad when you lose your home. That's a, that's a terrible situation for a family to be in. And that foreclosure is going to occur whether we like it or not. And so you as an investor, just as an example, what if you as an investor could go in and work with that family, work with that homeowner that's going to lose their home no matter what, but instead of that bank just foreclosing on them and kicking them to the curb where they have nothing, what if you could go in and you could negotiate with the bank and with that family, with that homeowner and make it to where maybe that homeowner gets five, $10,000 in their pocket to leave that home that now gives them money to go put a down payment on a rental so they're not kept, kicked out and living homeless. Now at least they can put a house over their heads, a roof over their heads again. And in the meantime, the bank still accomplishes what they want. And you as the investor, you make some money, you put some money in your pocket. Maybe you make 20, 30, $50,000 by facilitating that, being educated, knowing what you're doing. I mean, how many of you would be okay with that? And so when I talk about taking advantage of things and opportunities. I'm not taking, talking about taking advantage of people. I'm talking about taking advantage of opportunities and creating these win-win situations. Is that fair enough for everybody? Is that okay? And that's what this is all about. And so positioning ourselves today to take advantage of these opportunities, knowing what's coming is what that volatility is all about. And that's why you see people like Warren Buffett that are sitting in so much cash right now. That's why you see people that are unloading. I mean, we did an episode a week or two ago where we listed out all these different trillionaires, these Bezoses and uh, JP Morgans and, and Ray Dalios and all these people that are unloading all this money for the first time in decades. You know, they see the writing on the wall. They're getting ready for this in most cases. And so we're, we want to start doing that same thing. And then, of course, um, you know, why aren't more people successful? It really does just lead back to the mindset. And I know we gave you some different examples there, following the status quo, doing what's always been done, fear we talked about. You know, life is also one of those things. You know, how many people uh, just a few short years ago, four short years ago, 2020, um, COVID hit? Nobody in the world expected that. But how many people lost their jobs? How many people were down their last hundred dollars? How many people had to do things they never expected that they'd have to do before? Take on loans, take on more debt, whatever, just to survive. On social media, on Facebook, just this week, I had a, a four-year memory pop up. And that's why I like Facebook is because of the memories. When you post things, it reminds you later. And so a, a video popped up from four years ago, um, you know, this past week, and it was the first video I did on Zoom after COVID hit. So, you know, Chris and I originally launched Money School as a live events company. We started traveling the country doing live in-person events, teaching all this stuff in person. And that was the business plan, was to do a live event, invite people back for three days to spend with us in person. And we were flying to all these different cities doing this in person every single week. We were in Orlando getting ready to do an event when the president came on TV and shut the whole country down, the 14 days to slow the spread crap. And so... That was the first Zoom video I did um, after that occurred. And we were talking about, hey, we're going to figure this out with you. We're going to start doing Zooms and, and virtual. And it was really cool to think back on that. And, you know, then I was talking to my wife about it. And I was like, do you remember how tough that was? Like we, 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 you know, everything changed for us at that point. Um, as far as, as business goes, our plans, financially, everything, because everything got shut off. And that really opened my eyes to, man, like 
this was out of my control completely. Nobody could plan for this. So many people lost their jobs. Like, so life happens. You know, you hear it all the time. One of the largest reasons for financial devastation in this country is divorce. You know, divorce drives people to financial ruin. Um, money drives marriages apart. You know, if you have a husband and wife that are starting to argue over money, I would, I, I don't bet much sometimes on sports for fun. But if I was a gambling person, I would bet 10 times out of 10 times that that husband and wife that's starting to argue over money will be divorced within 12 months to two years. It always happens. And it's so sad because there's no reason for money to drive a wedge between people. Money is abundant, especially in this country. It's just we've been our whole lives following the status quo, doing what's always been done. All the stuff we've been talking about, there's no reason for it. We can be smart with this stuff. So that's why all of you that are on this right now, the 5%, as we call you, that's the difference. You're not, you know, watching the news or out there wasting, you know, taking a nap or something. Which, by the way, I saw this guy last night. He's like, to all of you out there that didn't take a nap today, congratulations, you pulled an all day or, you know, like an all nighter, but like you never took a night anyways. Um, so all of you that are on right now, not napping, getting financial education, con congratulations, because that's what this is all about. So life can get in the way, but it's all about being prepared, playing it for it. Death is another big one. And one of the cool things we don't talk a lot about that I know, uh, Craig, you wanted to talk a little bit about today was when we start talking about where we can change the one thing where our money goes first and what that vehicle is. Well, one of the huge benefits of that is it comes with a death benefit and a large death benefit. So if death does occur unexpected, it doesn't leave you and the family in financial ruin like it does to so many other people. And that's just a cherry on top. That's not even the reason we do this, which is just so cool to me. So with that said, anything to add to that, Craig? Yeah, I think that leads into a conversation about opportunity cost. So it, you know, whether we're buying a car we're funding kids college, we're going on vacation. So I know Shauna, one of your use cases is to, to do the Disney trip. Mm -hmm. And every time you have a dollar in your hand, as soon as you spend it, the question is, what can you do with that dollar from now on? Nothing. So all we're talking about is simply putting that in a tool before it goes to do that job. And, and there's so many different use cases out there because it's called the infinite banking concept. There's an infinite number of ways of using it. Can you, can you use it for a home improvement project? Can you buy a car? Can you use it for investing? So the, there's a lot of different use cases out there, but the big point is just think about that opportunity cost. Every time you have a dollar, what are you doing with it? Do you ever feel like you don't have control of your real estate business or your money? That's right. The big banks and the institutions, they're in control, right? I know you've felt that before. Private Money Club puts you back in the driver's seat. As members often tell us, it's a total game changer. Join the community of like-minded lenders and borrowers by going to privatemoneyclub.com and sign up. You know, I was talking to a a gal, it was probably three months ago, and she said, I mean, I've been doing this for a long time, but she said something that really made me think, because I hadn't looked at it this way in the past. She said, my husband and I have probably earned about a million dollars in in total income over our lifetime. And she said, and we don't have any of it left. We don't have any of it. And And it just, if you can rewind and go back in time and just start running that money through this special tool that we talk about all the time, which is a specially designed whole life policy, it's over there compounding while you're using it and replacing it. And if you walk away with nothing else today, think about that opportunity cost every time you have a dollar. Is there a better way of, of dealing with that dollar? Absolutely. And we can definitely show some different examples and whatnot of that right now. And, you know, this uh, quote on the screen right now is one of the first slides I ever saw Chris present. And I think he might've got this from Brent Kessler and, you know, Will Rogers, the problem in America isn't so much what people don't know. It's what people think they know that just ain't so. And why that quote to me is so powerful is the last 45 minutes of us talking right now, that kind of sums it up, right? I mean, think about that for just a second. Like how many things that we do? And, and you know what's crazy is I just, when you were talking, Craig, I just happened to look over at my text messages 
And my mom sent me a text just now. She said, I forgot to tell you before you're on vacation, I was driving home from school with Bryce and we were chatting. Bryce is my eight-year-old son. And um, he said, he said something about a problem. And I interjected and said, I prefer to use the word challenge. And he asked why, and she explained the difference, you know, what's a problem versus a challenge. And he looks at her and goes, why are you so smart, gaw? Like he calls her as gaw. And it's just one of those things I like, I feel like my eight-year-old kind of grasps some of these things. But, it, you know, at the end of the day, like a problem and a challenge, it's the same thing. But by making that one shift in the way you look at it and approach it, can that make a difference? In my opinion, Absolutely, 100%. And Shauna, you know this, like we have a lot of challenges in our businesses because of the growth that we have, um, because of how many people we help and we work with. And we're always looking at improving. And one of my pet peeves, one of the things that I 100% I of the time do is I never will come to a meeting with problems. I'll always come to a meeting with problems, but also with ideas and solutions to start to start solving those problems. Why? Because I do look at things as a challenge instead of a problem. There's no problems. They are challenges. So I just thought that was funny. My mom just texted me that as Craig was talking. Yeah. yeah. Um, and real quick on that. I know, I know Xander on our team has a really good, cause we do use that la language is super powerful. So just what your, just what your mom did. And I know that Xander sometimes will correct us in the moment and say, and, and, and tell us to call it a challenge because it also, I feel like triggers something in your brain to like, want to overcome it. Then more, when you say a problem, it almost, you, you usually use it as like, it's, it's, it's an excuse or something. And then you stop, you stop going after it. And then I've been listening to Earl Nightingale again, because I kind of have been running into my own challenges and I need a nice refresher. But you know, he was uh, yesterday, the, my takeaway was successful people have all the same problems as anyone else. The difference is they know how to effectively solve them. So that's what we're just trying to do. Captain of your own ship, right? Yep. Yeah, very cool. Okay, so so let's let's get into this a little bit now. Let's let's talk about what this is all about and what what we mean by all this. And so one one of the things before we get to the vehicle and we start showing some different examples is this is an important um, subject here. And Regina, I see it says raise your hand. If you have any questions, throw those in the Q and A box, and we'll definitely answer those for you. So here's a here's a really simple example of how to start thinking about you know, money and, and what we can actually do when we understand how money works. And so we ask this question and go to put in the comment box what you think the answer is, um, especially if you're new. So how many of you think that you can make money? Can you make money earning 4% while paying 6%? What do you think? Yes or no? Can you make yeah, and, money? And maybe for 4%? some of the new, some of the new people, just to put it in another context is if you had $25,000 sitting in your bank account and you walked into the bank and said, Hey, Mr. Or Mrs. Banker, I want to take my $25,000 out to go buy a car, let's say. And the banker says, no, 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 wait a minute. Why don't you go ahead and leave your $25,000 in the savings account making 4% and I'll give you a loan for 6%. The question now is, is the banker being dishonest with you? So um, before you give the, the numbers, Stephen, let's just query the group. Who thinks the banker's being honest saying it's better to take the 6% loan while you leave your money and they're growing at 4%? Does anybody think the banker is being honest here? So you have a lot of people saying the banker's not honest. The banker's trying to pull a fast one on us by offering us that 6% loan. Yeah, I mean, if I if I went into a bank, Craig, and I'm like, hey, I want to I want to buy a car, you know, I want my $25,000 to go buy this car with. And they were like, okay, but your money's earning 4%, you know, and I'll give you a loan at 6%. I'd be like, two birds, give me my 25 <laughs> grand. I want to go buy the car. Why would I do that? Right. I mean, that's what most people would think. Let's break it down. So here we go. So if we, if we do the math on this, so, so we have to understand kind of how loans work a little bit and then what this actually looks like in reality. So in a, in a car note, let's just say 6% for 60 months, five years, which is pretty common. That $25,000 loan that they give you, you're going to make monthly car payments on that. If we do the math, it's $483 a month. So if we look at this over the next five years, 60 months, that $25,000 at 6%, um, the bank's going to end up collecting twenty just under $29,000 back. 
So just under $4,000 the bank would make on this. Now, what we've talked about with the 4%, what's going on over here? So if we left our money sitting in there, like the banker recommended the 25 grand and it grows at uh, 4% for those same 60 months, those same five years, what ends up happening? Well, this money, this 25 grand ends up growing to be just over $30,500. So if we do the math on that, if we would have listened to that banker, even though our brain was telling us not to listen to the banker, but if we would have listened to the banker in this example, we actually would have made $1,500. So think about that for a second. Why does that happen? And so if we look at this car note over here, the 25,000, what happens each month? Well, each month you make a $483 payment, it reduces the $25,000 balance. And that 6% that's being charged on a car note on a simple interest loan, it gets it, the 6% is charged on the outstanding balance. So over time, the amount of money that you're paying interest on becomes less and less. So at the end of the day, it ends up only being $29,000, around $4,000 in growth for the bank. But over here in our account, at 4% over that same amount of time, what's going on? Well, that $25,000 initial balance, every time it grows by 4%, it's increasing that balance. And then each time that larger balance grows by 4% and grows by 4% and grows by 4%. And that's why um, at the end of the day, you end up making about $5,500 as opposed to 4,000 because of that compounding interest over here. Compounding interest is very, very powerful. Now imagine instead of just 60 months, five years, what if this sat in there and did that now for the rest of your life? What if this now sat in there and, and, and while it's in there compounding and growing every year for the rest of your life, you could also then take that money out and use it to do things like buy this car over here simultaneously. And that is what infinite banking is all about. So that's what we want to get into right now. I'm going to talk about the machine and then I'm going to have um, Craig start giving some examples of how we can use this machine in our everyday lives in real situations. Now, if you watch this whole kind of what we call the 90 minute video, we get into some examples of how to um, pay down debt a lot faster than otherwise possible. We show you how to get back every dollar for every car you'll ever buy, drive and own. So definitely watch the full 90 minute video if you're new to this. Um, but we wanted to show some new examples today, but let me just keep with the basics. So what are we talking about? What is this vehicle that we're gonna change? One thing where our money goes first. Well, that one thing is a whole, a specially designed and engineered dividend paying whole life insurance policy. Now, I just want to be very clear about this. The reason we use a whole life insurance policy is because there's no other vehicle in the world that allows us to put our money into it, have guaranteed tax-free compounding growth while simultaneously being able to take that money out while all that is occurring, simultaneously take the money out to use it for other things. And that's what a whole life policy allows us to do. Now, the reason it's a specially designed and engineered whole life policy is because when you listen to people like Dave Ramsey and some of these guys out there that talk about whole life, they talk about traditional whole life which traditional whole life have high commissions. It takes many, many, many years before you can access that money and use it. The growth in it can take longer. Now, whole life in the long term can still be a good vehicle. It's nothing I'm personally interested in, but for the right case, it can make sense. Um, but what we do is we take a whole life policy, we kind of dice it and slice it and we morph it and we turn it into a vehicle that we can use for what's called the infinite banking concept. And what that allows us to do is when we, and, and just to be clear, myself, Craig, our money mentors, our team, we do this every single day for you as the client. And we don't charge anything for any of this. Okay, we do make a commission from the insurance company, but it's not that high commission from a, a traditional whole life policy because we slice it and dice it, especially engineered for infinite banking. We the, when we do that by the design of it, we take a very reduced commission to be able to design it that way. Remember, there's give and get in everything. So for us to give you more benefits immediately to use this thing, we have to give up commission. Okay, but nonetheless, that's how we get paid and we do a lot of volume, obviously. And so when we specially design this whole life policy, it's not going to give you all these advantages. We can dump tons of money into it. We can um, we can design it almost literally for however you want. Like, it's pretty amazing what we can do with these things. So I just wanted to kind of make that clear real fast. 
Um, you might hear some other names. You might hear like Bowley Bank Own Life Insurance. Uh, the reason you hear that is because banks are actually the largest purchasers of whole life insurance in this country. Banks put over 90% of their M1 money supply into real estate and into whole life insurance policies. So, you know, if banks are doing it, we're mimicking the banks, we're becoming our own banks. That's why we focus a lot on how do we put our money into these policies and then for a lot of us, why are we doing real estate? And that's why. But you might also hear Coley, company-owned life insurance, same thing. But we can take these policies and design and engineer and almost do anything for them. So just keep that in mind, okay? With that being said, I just want to show this, this one last thing on how we change where our money goes first and what that looks like. And then, Craig, if we can get us some of those examples. Is that cool? Yeah, sounds great. Okay. So you've been hearing me say now for a, for a hot minute here, change one thing where your money goes first. So what does that actually mean? Well, our money has to go somewhere. So for most people, most people take their money and they put it into a, a bank account. All right, so let's just do a little comparison here. So we, we created this, this little graphic just to kind of give a, 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 a little T chart. So we have a bank account over here and we have an infinite banking special design policy over here on this right side. So the, remember, your money has to go somewhere. You could put it under a mattress. Worst idea. You could put it into a regular bank account, better than a mattress probably, but uh, still all kinds of challenges there. Or we could put it into this policy, which I'm going to show you why that's the best option and, 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 and why we do that, okay, in a second. But let's just compare real fast. So on the left side, we have a bank. So if we look at liquidity, both are liquid. Okay. If I put $100,000 into my bank account, I could go get that money out within a day or two. Um, if I put $100,000 in my policy, I could either take the money out and have it available to me immediately, just like a bank account. Or if I have it in the policy, I need to request it. It might take a week to get to me. Okay. So still relatively very, very liquid. Um, in a bank checking account, you might get, I don't know, 0.07% is the national average right now. Maybe you get one or 2%, whatever the case might be. Over in the policy, we're going to get anywhere from 2 to 6% um, growth. Now, the difference in this is this is uninterrupted compounding growth. So even when we use the money, this is still occurring. Over here, if we use the money, we get zero. Okay, so big difference there. Um, the money, the growth in a bank account, the little growth that you do get is taxable. The growth within the policy is tax-free. Money in a bank account is uh, liable to creditors, debtors, bankruptcies, lawsuits, judgments. Um, in most cases, in almost all cases, uh, the money in the policy is completely private and protected. The money in the bank account is unstable, uh, meaning can banks collapse? Absolutely. Sure, there's $250,000 in FDIC insurance, but... What if that goes bankrupt, which could easily, easily happen? Um, you know, not only that, but the rates can vary. You know, different things can happen at banks. Uh, we hear it run on banks all the time. In a policy, these insurance companies have been around for almost 200 years. They've weathered the storms. They've done unbelievably well in past recessions and things of that nature. These insurance companies that these policies are with, these mutually owned insurance companies are very, very, very stable, especially in times of economic uncertainty. And then, of course, the money in a bank account is probably, you know, if you were to pass away, that money will probably go through probate or something of that nature. The money in the policy uh, it comes with not only is it going to be passed on to your loved ones um, tax free. It doesn't go through probate or anything like that, but also it's much larger amount. You know, if I have a hundred thousand dollars in my policy, I might have a million dollars in death benefit that goes tax free uh, to my beneficiaries. So this is a simple little cheat chart of why. Now it literally is as simple as this: where our money goes first. So if I earn money, I'm going to take that money and I'm either going to put it into a bank account. Or once I learn about infinite banking, I'm going to put it into a specially designed whole life policy. It's that easy. And then once it's in there, now that's where the power of this comes into play. That's where you start. Now that you've become your own bank, now you're going to become your own banker. Now you're going to start actually implementing and practicing what we call the infinite banking concept. 
And the reason it's called infinite banking concept is because there's an infinite amount of ways to use this policy and this concept. And we're going to show you a couple of those um, here in just a minute. But before we get there, Craig, one more thing. Sorry, one, one quick thing. question before you Go leave ahead. that chart. If if I am a bank and I have tier one capital, where am I putting my money? Whole life into bank owned life insurance policies, mostly into whole life policies. So question. you're telling me the banks tell us to put our money in their bank, but they're taking their money and putting it in the policy. Right. Interesting. Right. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's the little things like that, that once you hear them, you can't unhear them. You, you can never forget them, right? Um, so so quick example of what that looks like by changing that one thing. So this is how most people spend money. Uh, this is just a kind of an average annual, what people spend money on. So if every dollar earned, 10% goes to uh, their automobile, or I'm sorry, 20, 20%. So 20 cents of every dollar goes to an automobile. 30 cents of every dollar goes to housing. You know, whether that's a mortgage, insurance, taxes, rent, whatever the case might be, which today that's probably a lot higher for housing, but this is a few years old, uh, which leaves 40% to everything else, travel, entertainment, kids, food, which again, that's probably more now because I know savings is going way down. But historically speaking, at the end of the day, after people pay for their car, pay for their house, pay for all their entertainment and food and, and, and necessities of living, most people have about 10% at the end of the day that they put away into savings. So what if we reverse that? What if we take that same dollar that we earn and instead of paying everybody else first, what if we make one change and pay ourselves first? So we take that money and we take that 10% and we put it into a policy first. Now, what can that look like as life goes on? Well, now that we're putting the money into our own bank first, well, when we go out there to buy an automobile, for example, instead of going to someone else's bank and borrowing that money, we're going to go to our own bank and borrow that money to buy that car. So what does that look like? Well, out of every 20 uh, cents that's spent on an automobile, on average, five cents of that 20 cents, 5% of that 20% goes towards interest to that bank for borrowing that money. So if we go to our bank to buy that money, are you okay with being an honest banker and paying yourself interest just like you would pay another bank interest? Well, hopefully, because that's what being an honest banker and the infinite banking concept is all about. So instead of giving that five cents for every dollar to someone else's bank, we're not going to give that five cents of every dollar back to our bank. Think about it. By making that one change right there, what did we just accomplish? We just increased our annual savings by 50%. Think about it. If we were saving 10 cents of every dollar prior, but now we're able to save, we're able to take that five cents that we're giving away to someone else's bank and put it into our savings, our family, what happens there? That five cents, we were saving 10, now we got an extra five. That's a 50% increase in savings by making that one change right there. And then what if we do this with other things in life? What if we were to do that with housing? I mean, believe it or not, 25 out of every 30 cents spent on housing goes to interest. If you've ever looked at an amortization schedule, it's something like 90% of interest is paid in the first like seven to 10 years. And did you know on average people refinance or get a, they sell and buy a new house and get a new mortgage on average every seven years in this country? So they're resetting that amortization schedule and paying all that interest upfront to the banks all the time. And so at the end of the day, 25 out of 30 cents of every dollar goes to the banks in a form of interest. So what if instead of giving to somebody else's bank, what if we gave that to our bank? And then if we look at everything else, just on average interest, about five cents of every dollar uh, goes to banks. So let's just go ahead and recapture that back too. So what do we just accomplish right there? By making no changes other than where our money goes first, paying ourselves first, putting it into our bank and some somebody else's bank, spending like we would anyways, we just increased our annual savings from 10 cents to 40, 40%, from 10% to 40% by making no other change. So again, it's kind of a elementary example, but I just want you to start thinking that mindset shift. What if I start paying myself first? What if I put my money into my bank instead of somebody else's bank? What would that look like for me financially? And then that's where our team can really dig in with you. We can use the tools that Craig has created, and we're going to show you some of those right now to show you how this would apply to your actual real life 
example. So with that being said, Craig, you want to start pulling some of these up? Yeah, so we can take the next 15, 20 minutes. I'll just run through a quick use case. So it, as we've been kind of presenting the whole time, there there's a lot of different ways to use this process. And whether you're buying a car, whether you're paying for someone's college education, your kid's college education, whatever it might be, um, lots of different uses. So what I want to walk through right now is a quick example of a use case I did for a client wanting to uh, fund their kid's college. Just to kind of lay the groundwork, as we're going through this, I'm going to be talking about them paying for college. But see this box that says college? You can think about that could be a, a dealership where you bought your car. That could be really anything. So as we go through this, I want you just to really focus on how the money's flowing. And this is just one, one way to, to build this, this process out. All right. So here, here's the situation. There's a, a couple, they were paying for their son's college and, you know, they have some pretty good cash flow in their system and they both are, you know, high wage earners. And what they were doing is taking $4,000 every month coming from their income and their bonuses. And they're putting it into a high yield savings account and kind of squirreling the money away there. Um, so that's where they were storing their money. And as they built up more and more, they would every month four thousand dollars would be going to the college to pay for their kids' college. So every month four thousand dollars is leaving their family forever. So remember, we talked about the opportunity cost. That four thousand dollars is gone. They won't be able to use that again. They won't be able to leverage that ever again in their life. So the question was, is there a better way to do this? So we we started thinking about. How could we structure a, a policy, a be your own banker policy in order to get the system built up enough to where they could take the money out and start paying for college, but yet run the money through the policy? So other than the 60,000 they're putting initially, they weren't putting in any new money to the system. They were using that same 4,000 that was going to the college and running that back into the, into the system. So it did take a little bit of, of capital to get the system running, but from here on out, they'd be able to recapture all of the all of the college funds. So let me just go ahead and build this out. I didn't realize this was a build here. I know there's a lot on here, so I'm gonna just kind of methodically walk through this slide. And we're gonna start over with this great big dollar sign. That great big dollar sign will be your income, could be your bonuses, could be whatever, money you're using to pay for that thing. In this case, they were putting $4,000 of their income going straight to the college. And what we did is we said, let's set up a segregated bank account. There's nothing magical about a segregated bank account other than it's just a separate account that's something different than your day-to-day -day month, you know, day-to-day -day expenses. Um, we're just keeping this, this, this thing separate. So every month, just like they were putting into their high yield savings account, they're going to put this into their segregated bank account. Now, remember we juiced the system or we started the, the banking system with that 50,000 dump and a 10,000 yearly premium. And the reason we did that is we were going to take out $12,000 quarterly and put it into the segregated account. Why they did it that way is every that would allow them to you know pay the college bill for a thousand dollars a month for the quarter. So every quarter they're just going to take out new money, put it in the segregated account, keep paying the college, while they keep funding the segregated account with this four thousand. Now remember how I said there's no more new money being put into the system, other than that fifty thousand dump and the ten thousand premium. What they're going to do is of this 48,000 that they're accumulating in this account, they're going to put $38,000 back into the policy, back into their own system. So remember Stephen was talking about just taking that interest from the car purchase in that previous slide and putting it into your own system. That's all we're doing is we're now paying that, that loan or that interest into our own, our own system. So of the 48,000 a year, 38,000 goes back in as a loan repayment, and we're going to keep 10,000 available for the annual premium. 
So you see, there's no more new money. They were already sending that four thousand dollars to the college every month, and now it's just running through the through the the policy every quarter, taking out twelve thousand and then paying the college bill. So does everybody kind of see how the money how the money flows? It comes in once a year. It pays the loans. It pays the premium back out into the college. So what's the benefit of doing this? What's going on in that, that BYOB box? So Stephen covered this earlier. What's happening to all the money in that BYOB box? Can anyone tell me in the chat? And it, it has something to do with that 4%, 6% example we went through. So Shane says compounding, accruing interest. Yeah, everyone's been listening. This is awesome. So Stephen, kudos. You got You got everyone educated on this. So all of the dollars that we put into this are continually to compound for the rest of this person's insured life. So that's really what's going on is compounding while we're using it. So that is, that is what's going on behind the scenes. Now, this is what we call the wall of numbers. And what I'm going to, to just go over here quickly is this is a policy design. So if you were if you were to schedule a meeting with any of our money mentors, and Stephen, I don't know if you want to put the 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 money mentor link in there, but this is where you can have a conversation specifically about your use case. You're trying to buy a car, you're trying to run money through for an investment. What we're going to do is design a policy for you that works for your situation. But here's what's going on with this design. For every policy year, so remember in the first year, they put in 60,000 because 50,000 was a dump in, 10,000 was the premium. And just like Stephen talked about in the comparison of the bank versus the policy, there are guarantees. So, so you will have guarantees, unlike a bank, which, you know, right now there's some high yield savings accounts that are pretty attractive, but, you know, go rewind five years ago when you're getting 0.001% in your savings account. This is guaranteed. So you can expect to get this type of cash value and death benefit, even if the insurance companies don't pay dividends. But Stephen, can you remind us, when has the companies that we work with, when do they not pay dividends? They, they've they never not paid dividends um, since their inception, which has been 130 to 150 years with our two primary companies. They've always paid consistent, strong dividends. So we feel pretty comfortable, even though they're not guaranteed, we feel pretty comfortable that they're going to continue that since they've been through world wars, they've been through the Great Depression, they've been through some pretty hard times and they're paying dividends when banks are failing. So what we then do is focus on this these numbers in the blue area, which is looking at your projected cash value. This, of course, will be with the dividend. And one of the efficiency measures we look at is when will this particular policy have cash on cash, which means if I put a dollar in the policy, when will I have at least a dollar of, of growth? And you see by year two, sometimes this is year two, sometimes it could be three or four, so don't get too, too concerned about the numbers, but this policy was designed with some pretty high efficiencies with the trade-off of, of growth in the future. So that's the trade-off. The sooner you get the cash out, there's usually some, some impact to the long-term growth. But essentially what we're getting at is, remember how they needed $4,000 a month to fund the college. So we needed to make sure we had at least 48,000 available for a loan. So with this policy design, they are able to access almost $50,000 within uh, the first 30 days. They only needed 48, so that's what they took out as a loan. And, and we're looking at this on a yearly basis. So that loan interest cost was about $2,400 to them. So remember, we're growing, we're compounding, but we also have an interest um, cost. And in that intro video that Stephen played with Chris going over infinite banking, he said, remember the spread, just like we did the 4% versus the 6%, there was a spread. Even though we we're compounding at four, paying at six, we had a positive spread you are going to have a positive spread even though you're paying some loan interest here. But the net of it is, if you remember back to the diagram, they were putting in 38,000 back into the loan. So they took a $48,000 loan, but they put 38,000 back in. And so they have a $10,000 loan remaining. 
And they just keep doing this year after year while they're paying for their son's college. And so at the end of four years, they've accumulated about $40,000 of, of loan that they need to pay off. So we we just said, keep paying that $4,000 a month into your segregated account for one more year. And by then they'll be fully restored. So here's the gist of it. At the end of the cycle of paying off all their college for their son, they would have normally paid what what's 48,000 times four. I'm, I'm not so good with simple math. So 192,000. So here's the question. Would you rather pay 192,000 to the college and have lint in your pocket, maybe a mint from the, the restaurant you just went out to, or would you rather have a system built where you've got, if we look at the end of year um, five, around 98,000 captured in your system. And that's kind of what we were looking at. Is there a way to capture as much of that money as we possibly can versus letting every single dollar go to the college? What we end up doing is creating kind of a, a, a loan payback structure, if you will. So every quarter, remember they were taking out $12,000, putting it in the segregated account to pay the, the college bill. And then they were putting... Um, essentially $4,000 is going back into the loan because it was it was 38000 that goes into the loan every year. That means if they do it that way, their, their net net loan cost would be about $275. So they're not really spending a lot of money to use this money while it's compounding. But anyway, this is just kind of how some of the loans work. And I know I'm flying over some of that at a high level. Um, but what I want to do is kind of get down to the, the summary slide here. <clears throat> so when we put this all together for, for this client, the question was, do you want to see $192,000 of capital leave your family forever? Because that's what it would cost in their, their son's college. Or do you want to look at some of these other benefits of doing it another way by simply changing where that money goes first? So in the first seven years, they will have somewhere between six hundred to seven hundred thousand dollars of death benefit. God forbid something happens to the the wage earner of the family while their their son's going to college. Well, guess what? If something does happen to them, they've got a death benefit that's not only going to pay for the college, but allow their family to to have some income to kind of smooth out the the bumps, the financial bumps, I should say. At month 61, when they're done paying back this system in full, they'll have $98,000 of cash value that was captured into their system. So think about the difference. As opposed to paying $192,000 and it's all gone, they now have $98,000 to use again. So that's a, pretty diff that's a pretty big difference there. And at the end of year 10, they're going to continue paying that, putting that $10,000 in because Guess what their next phase was? Retirement. So they wanted to start thinking about how can we pay for our son's college, capture some money in the system, and then have some money at the end of, say, year 10 to start using it for retirement. So just by doing this, this system at the end of year 10, they'll have about 150000 of cash value to use for retirement. So Stephen, Private Money Club, what could you do with 150000 What kind of income could that possibly generate if you became an educated private lender? Yeah, I mean, you know, $150,000, let us just say, let's just say a conservative 12% first position loan would provide me with um, $1,500 a month mm -hmm. in income. So by by doing this system, I mean it if they were to do that strategy Stephen's talking about, they could generate close to fifteen hundred dollars of income off of that hundred and fifty thousand of cash value. Yeah, without touching, you know, principal or anything like that. Right. So they're not dipping into the, you know, the uh the cash value. They're just they're not dipping into the principal of the or doing withdrawals, they're just using the cash value that's available. So one of the things I want to to also iterate is what if what if instead of paying college we paid debt off what if we bought cars 
the same thing remains true. At some point, you're you're going to you know have some cash value, and maybe you hit retirement. It's a great strategy to to use this money throughout your life to pay for the things you need and want, and then you build up this capital in order to be able to use that for uh, retirement income. So. Are there any questions on this strategy? I know I went through it pretty quickly, but I just wanted to give a use case. Um, again, if this was college, but it could be pretty much anything you you want for that green box. So Sean is back. She's done doing uh, driving around the yard and getting stuck yeah. in the mud. I, and, and Craig, I'll, I'll give you one more example um, real fast of kind of you know what that looks like okay. in reality. So... You know, we start talking about, you know, all the things you were saying, you know, what if you don't have any bad debt or, you know, how do you use this to pay off the bad debt? Well, what if you don't have any, or, you know, what if you don't, you know, want to use it for buying a car, you know, things like that. Um, you know, can you still, should you still start a policy and and use and do this? And, you know, that's what, what we do now, you know, we use our policies to grow our wealth and, and net worth and, and everything else by, by having our money uninterrupted compounding, protected, safe private and then we take that money from the policies via the loan like you're saying and we we put it in all these different ventures i mean um you know active real estate passive real estate businesses uh you know i'm not doing any stocks or options right now but as the markets get more volatile i'll get back into that stuff i've had multiple startups over the years um you know note investing with somebody like kevin short I mean, there's so many options out there so you know one of the reasons you know this kind of brings it home right here but you know, what I've learned over the years, the two laws for creating growing wealth, compound and interest. And actually, Albert Einstein was coined with saying this. He called it the eighth wonder of the world. Those who understand it, use it. Those who don't pay it. And then number two, to create wealth, you got to have your money always working for you. You got to have your money in motion. Your money's always got to be out there. You know, like we say, little green army men that are getting the spoils of war and bringing them back to you. And so the cool thing about the infinite banking costs, these specially designed whole life policies is it allows us to do both of those, you know, rules. Those are laws to build wealth. You have to have these implemented if you really want to be successful financially. And so these policies allow us to do both of these things simultaneously, which is just so powerful. So here's an example I like to use. This was a real estate investor. This is a policy I did for her a couple of years ago. Um, she had 150 grand sitting in a bank account you know, unprotected, not doing anything. So she dumped that into the policy. She only wanted to do 50,000 a year moving forward though. Um, so we dumped a larger amount in the first year, 50 grand a year after that. And then you can see over here, you know, what the cash value is each year. But let me just, just create a scenario. So she's an active real estate investor. So she's using this policy to buy real estate right now. But her goal is to get into passive real estate, which is like private money lending. So let's just say in the eighth year of this policy, she gets to the point where she could be a passive investor. So what would that look like? Well, she takes the money in the eighth year of this. Uh, her policy in the eighth year grows by $66,000. That's the increase in the net cash value. To get that 66 grand, she has to put $48,000 into her bank, which she does right there. So the bank grew by $18,000, 37% cash on cash return. So let's say she now takes that money and she finds a deal on Private Money Club at 12%, like we just talked about, and she lends that money. Well, what would that look like? Well, at the end of the day, she'll make 12% on the private money loan. She made 37% within the policy. She paid 5% to the insurance company to use that money for the private money loan. So we got to subtract that. But when it's all said and done, she earned 44% on her money. So what would this have looked like had she not started her own bank eight years prior? Well, she would have been funneling money through a, a, a traditional bank. Every time she used the money, that money would go away. Every time she put it back in the bank, it might grow by a half a percent, which is basically nothing. And at the end of the eight years, she would have lent her money on a deal and made 12%. We'd all, we're all happy with a 12% return. But if you could change one thing where your money goes first, eight years prior, knowing that it's at 12%, you're going to make 44%. Why would you not do that? And that's what becoming your own bank is all about. We didn't do anything different except where our money went first. Does that make sense? You know, and, and we can do this with any amount. I mean, this was a young guy, 38 years old. He had $50,000 from a wholesale deal he did, but he was kind of new to real estate and he 
was putting a lot of money back into his business. So he was only comfortable saving 500 bucks a month. So we designed a policy, 50,000 going in up front and then 500 bucks a month. And, you know, that was this policy. But look in the 10th year of this thing, 54% cash on cash return. You know, when he's 62 years old, uh, 25 years later, 62 years old, uh, 281% tax-free returns within that policy. I mean, these things just really, really take off and accelerate. And again, it's doing nothing different except changing where your money goes first. And that's the power of all this at the end of the day. I love it. Um, can you go back a slide to that example? Because it, um, who was it? Robert had a question about how the death benefit kind of is, is up and then it goes down at certain times. And I know that your lady had the same exact example where like at year seven, she started to put in less and then her death benefit went from like 2 million to 1 million. Can we explain why that happens? Yeah, I can show you right out here. Yeah. Um, yeah. So let me just pick a pen. All right, so you'll see over here, um, let me just explain. So this is what we call an illustration. So when you get on the phone with one of our money mentors, we're gonna talk to you. We're gonna spend about 45 minutes to an hour talking with you about you know, what are your goals? Where are you financially now? What are you saving now? Where's your money going? Um, answer any questions you have about any of this stuff. Uh, I promise you every one of my money mentors is trained to never sell. Uh, we're simply here to answer questions and consult and try and, you know, explain this concept to you because we understand once this idea and concept clicks, uh, we don't need to do anything else. You're going to be asking us, how do you get started? And so that's what that call is all about. Um, so schedule the call. And once we determine, you know, kind of what that looks like, we're going to get started with an application for you. It is a whole life policy. So there's an approval process, typically a paramedical exam done, things like that. But right away, we're going to give you what's called an illustration. Now this illustration we give you initially can change um, you can change it anytime you want during the approval. You're not locked into anything. So once you go through the, the approval process, if you're like, actually, I want to put more money in or less money in or whatever, we can make tweaks and change it anytime. But we're going to give you your initial illustration. It's going to look something like this right here that you see on the screen. So it'll show you the age you are now, the year of the policy, the contract premium, which is what we call the deposits, because this is what you're going to deposit into your account. Now, let me just say one thing on the deposits. Let's just say the fourth year of this thing, she runs into some financial trouble, whatever reason. She cannot put 50 grand in. Well, the cool thing is, is in the fourth year of this, she can lower the premium deposit amount all the way down to about $18,000. So she has flexibility all these years to put anywhere between 50 and $18,000 in, depending on her financial situation. So 50 is the max, 18 would be the minimum. She can really put any amount she wants in. And the cool thing is even if she puts a lesser amount in this year, she can make up for it in future years in most cases. And so we got some flexibility with that premium just to kind of clarify that. And then what we see is these are non-guaranteed values. These are, or these are guaranteed values. These are non-guaranteed values. Again, we typically use and bank on the non-guaranteed values just because of 130 to 150 years track record plus the companies we use are financially the highest rated and uh, they're financially doing better than they've done in forever. They're all doing great right now. So we're going to bank on that value. Now, what this is showing over here is the increase in net cash value, meaning every time she makes a premium deposit, this is how much the bank's going to grow by. So you can see in the third year of this thing, the policy is already in what we call positive cash on cash, meaning she put 50 grand in and her bank, her policy grew by 50,614. And you'll see every year for the rest of her life, it just becomes more and more. I mean, you really want to get fun with this. I don't know if you have any, if you have a calculator on you. Yeah, I like $17,500 goes in in the 13th year, lucky number 13. Her bank grows by almost $50,000. I mean, where else can you put 17 grand and it grows by almost 50 grand immediately? You know, it's really cool. But to answer that question, when we design a policy for very high cash value, and especially if we do a dump in, meaning we're putting more into the policy in year one than the later years, that's what we call a dump in. So this would be a $100,000 dump in, 50,000 annual premium and another $100,000 dump in. So when we design a policy, we have to work within IRS rules and regulations. And these are what are called the MEC 7 pay rules. Um, so you're going to hear us talk about MEC sometimes, MEC. It stands for Modified Endowment Contract. And what those rules and regulations state is for every 
dollar, essentially every dollar of premium that goes into a whole life policy, you have to have so much death benefit that supports that premium and cash value within that policy. And so we can't just put in $150,000 and have like $10 in death benefit. It would net what's called net the policy, which basically just means you lose the tax benefits, you lose some of the protections. It would turn it from a whole life contract to a modified endowment contract. Now that'll never happen to you. We'll never design a policy that way. I'm just explaining why we're doing this. So when we design a policy, we max it out. We're going to max it right to that MEC limit to keep it a whole life policy. And to do that, um, sometimes we have to add term insurance into the policy. So the first seven of this, this first seven years of this policy have a combination of three different types of premiums going into it. Okay. So one, we have what we call the base premium. Two, we have what's called the paid up additions, the PUAs going into it. And number three, on this policy for the first seven years, there's also term insurance going into it. Now, if I had this actual illustration, I could scroll down um, to a couple pages later and it breaks it all out. So you can see exactly how much is going into the base, how much is going to the paid up additions and how much is going into the term. Anytime you hear us talking about policy splits, so you hear us say like 75-25, 60-40, 70-30, 90-10, whatever that is, that means how much paid up additions, the base. So if we had a $10,000 annual policy and 7,500 of that goes to PUAs, and $2,500 goes to base, that would be a 75-25 policy, okay? So if you ever hear us talk about that, that's what that means. But when we yeah, have to add term even... into this thing, what we do is we add the least amount of term possible for the least amount of time. Why? Because term has no added benefit to this other than avoiding mech. So we want to put as little amount on there for cost for as short amount as possible. So in this case, that's why you have that elevated death benefit. Because in the seventh year, that term drops off. So the term's on for seven years. Then the term drops off. It's no longer needed. And then from there, because of how whole life works, the death benefit will then continue to grow for the rest of your life. Does that make mm -hmm. sense? Yes. Cool. That was a good explanation. Thank you. And then um, I put the link to get on a call with our money mentors in the chat. And I just kind of specified, you know, this is, it's a 45 minute call. It's one-on-one -on -one, and it's not to learn about IBC. That's kind of why we do our Wealth Wednesday webinar. That's why we do Ask Me Anything. Um, don't feel discouraged if you're new from today. Like you don't need to be getting on a phone call and, and taking that next step. We encourage you to come back week after week until you feel ready to, to make that call. Um, but you know, we're here, whether you don't have a policy, whether you've had policy for years, that's what all these webinars and all these live appearances are for is for the learning. And you can also email me if you want to learn more. I have a ton of video resources. Um, and then just to get you more confident for that call, because when you do make that call, um, you know, it's for your goal setting, like, like Steven's example, that lady, she was a real estate investor. Like she knew what she wanted to do. She knew how much she wanted to put in roughly, you know, Steven coached her through that, you know, really helps her. They, they really help you, you know, be sure of what you, what it is that you want to do. But I just wanted to kind of put that disclaimer out there that like, you know, we really want to designate those phone call slots for those people who are really ready to move forward, um, and come back at four 30 you know, in just under two hours for more question and answer, of course. And we have a couple of questions in the q and I figured it'd be easier just to talk through those. Yeah. Um, the, the first one from Anonymous is asking about, I believe, the segregated account. Are we changing direct deposit to an account linked to the policy or making transfers after receiving funds in a regular bank account? The segregated bank account is simply a, a separate account from your your traditional you know, account that you buy your groceries with. Um, and what you'll do with your insurance company that you're working with, you'll have a portal and that'll have a connection with your account that you're paying your premiums, getting your loans. Um, so it, it really is not a requirement. It's just something that helps you on your accounting of keeping everything separate. 
Um, so it, it could be a separate account. It could be your main one. It just depends on how you want to do your, your own accounting. So if that, if that, uh, doesn't make sense, let me know. The next one from Mike, I'm not quite sure. I, it may have been, so Mike, you might need to qualify if that was when Stephen was going through his example, but um, he's just asking it, is it as simple as adding and subtracting interest rates? Yeah, I think he was talking okay. about the 12 plus whatever minus five equals 44. You know what I mean? So I think that's what he was talking about. Is it that simple? Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, it's showing if I was to do a private money loan with a hundred grand from my Wells Fargo checking account, I would earn 12%. Yeah. If I was to put the money into a policy and, you know, because you deposit the money in a bank account and you pull out to the private money loan and then you put it back at the end of the year, you made 12%. If I put it into a policy that's established, it's already in very positive cash on cash territory which just is a matter of time because it always happens on every single life policy guaranteed. And I take the total amount of growth of my wealth that year. Well, I'm going to have the growth within the policy guaranteed. So that's a given I'm doing, I'm getting that whether or not I'm doing the private money loan or not. But what I'm showing you is the power of being able to get that net worth growth while simultaneously doing something like a private money loan and earning money that way as well. And so yeah, it, it, you know, but no, it really is that simple. Yeah, and and we do have some tools that our concierge team uses to, you know, when you when you get into the process and and you're moving forward with, you know, your application, your exams, our concierge team can run a tool for you that actually does those projections, just like what Stephen was showing us. Like if you put in a hundred thousand into a private money club deal or whatever you invest in that you know I can understand. It will kind of project out how is your policy growing as well as how is that investment growing and just looking at the combination of those two. Um, so we do have some math behind the scenes on that one. Cool. And the last one, why do people push IULs over whole life? Um, I mean, my opinion is just ignorance and greed. They don't understand why they're doing it. They're told to do it by somebody that is greedy. And the reason I say greed is because the commissions are much higher on IULs, um, typically speaking. So, you know, they're doing it for them instead of the client or, and, or, and, or uh, just ignorance. They don't know any better. Um, there's a lot of shady people in this world, unfortunately, a lot of uneducated people in this world, unfortunately, and a lot of sheep in this world, unfortunately. So maybe somebody at the top is like, this is what you got to do. This is what you got to sell. This is what you got to teach us how to do it. And they don't think for themselves, they just go out there and do it. And, and, and that's what we end up with. And, you know, for better or worse, social media allows everybody to have a voice these days, but we've done lots of videos on, you know, IUL versus whole life. We've, had debates with IUL people we've um, compared and it's, it's never close. You know, there's a lot of fees, a lot of, you know, typically you don't get access as early on. There's a lot of risk involved with IULs, things like that. Um, and, you know, what we're looking for the whole life is that steady, consistent, protected, guaranteed uh, growth. And, and the whole life's the only thing that provides that. So. I feel like IULs, like, are they even provable yet? Like, you know what I mean? Because I just feel like they're just like infant banking is like a proven concept. It's something that like hundreds of thousands of people are using on it, like, and have been using for a long time. Like, I, I don't know, like, are IULs truly performing like as like, or, or I don't know, like, it just reminds me of one of those things where like, we don't know the long-term effects because it hasn't been around that long. Like, that's just what IULs remind me of is I don't know what the reality of it is. Yeah. I think we'll see a lot of, we'll see a lot of people get in, get in trouble. Um, I think we'll see a lot of complaints, uh, things like that against the IULs in the coming years. So we'll, uh, we'll see how well, that plays out. I think it's unfortunate though. Yeah. And a lot of the challenges, you know, we, we focus on the core of infinite banking, which is to have a guaranteed product on the foundation that you can build on. And the IUL comes with so many variables. And I can't tell you how many of these policies I've looked at. We can't advise on them, but sometimes we'll look at them and almost every single one of them is on a path to lapse. And it's just because there's so much complexity in, uh, um, you know, when the market, let's say when the market's down, 
they'll always say, well, there's a 0% floor, but the reality of it is there's still cost of insurance. And every year you get older, the cost of insurance goes up and that's got to come from somewhere when the market's down and it comes from your cash value, which means you now have to lower the death benefit, increase your premium. It's just, it just introduces so many variables and complexity that it just, it becomes hard to manage. Yeah, ben, Benny's bringing up a question in the chat, you know, it, it, he has an IUL, um, you know, can he roll it over? So I don't know what that looks like. Yeah, it, it depends, Benny. Um, we can, it's called a 1035 exchange. It, it just depends on the situation. And so we can, I would schedule a call with us and we can take a look. Um, you want to get what's called an in-force illustration and have that ready. And then we can take a look at what you have going on and, and kind of give you pros and cons and then let you decide what the best route moving forward would be. Uh, but we do that, um, yeah, quite frequently. Yeah. And then, um, and then Benny, just so you know, too, so D Devin Burr on our team, he, um, right before diving into infant banking, got into, into IULs too. So it's just sometimes that's just what happens. I don't know. Like we're, we, we're all human. We're all the same. And then um, I just wanted to point out sometimes a lot of the examples we use are like, to me, a pipe dream, like 155, 150,000, 50,000 a year policies. Like to me, that's like not my reality. So I know I put in the chat, like I started uh, my policy for like $5,800 a year, five years ago. And uh, it works just as well for me in my situation. So I don't ever want you guys to, to feel like you see these things. Um, and this isn't for you because some of the examples we use are just these amounts that are like, oh, wouldn't that be nice? So um, I'll put some resources in the chat and then you can also email me um, for more video resources, more more things for for you if that's you, you know, if, that, if that's your starting point. All right, cool. If anybody has any other questions, just schedule a call with us or join us at 4.30 Eastern on the YouTube channel at the Chris Noggle or on social media or on Facebook. And we are going to go live at 4.30 with an hour-long Q&A happy hour. And I don't know, Chris is in New Zealand, so I'm thinking I might have a couple beers today. First I don't know about you guys, but uh, that's what I'm <laughs> feeling. So we'll see you guys at 4.30. Thanks, everybody, for being on. Get those calls scheduled if you are comfortable. If not, we'll see you ne next week right here on Wealth Webinar. We'll see some of you at 4.30. Thank you, Shauna. Thank you, Craig. Uh, love those new tools you have. Love the discussion about college tuition and student debt and things like that. So keep knocking those out and you guys, uh, we'll see you soon. All right, see y'all. All right, so I hope you guys enjoyed that episode. We're putting up tons of them, but I think if you like this one, you'll probably like that video as well. Not only that, I've got a book that I created, Mapping Out the Millionaire Mystery, where we actually show you what the wealthy do in the game they play with money. I want you to have that for free. And if you want to know about all my new videos coming up, click that alert button. Actually, smash that alert button, and you'll be notified every time we put a new video. So we'll see you on the next episode.